uh, don't write uh, from me anything apart from the Quran. If you have, wipe it out. Okay? And um, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there isn't a, uh, a, a state-directed effort at recording the Sunnah, basically. That doesn't happen like it does with the Quran. There are... There, are, there is evidence, by the way, that the hadith were recorded. Some of the hadith were recorded at his time. Um, Abu recorded. recorded as well. Abu Huraira says, the only person who had more hadith than me was Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As because he used to write. Yeah? We know Abu Huraira, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made a special dua for his memory so that he doesn't forget. Right? There was an, an instance where the Prophet spread out a cloth and then folded the cloth and Abu Huraira's memory... He, he said he didn't forget anything after that. Right? But Abu Huraira says the only person who had more than me was Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As because he used to write. Abdullah ibn Amr As, he used to have, a, uh, he used to have scrolls which got passed down. Um, also, you know, for example, on Hajjatul Wada'a, um, no, sorry, not on Hajjatul on Fathu Makkah, uh, somebody called Abu Shah heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave a speech and he said, uh, O Prophet of Allah, uktubu li, and the Prophet said to his companions, Uktubu li Abi Shah, write for Abu Shah, what I've just said. So there is evidence that things were being recorded. But as I said, suffice it to say that it was left to individuals. Now, so how does the Sunnah of the Prophet survive? That's the question, right? Um, now, if you think about it, what happens is when the Prophet dies, he leaves behind a generation of people molded by him, right? Who were impacted by him and who uh, observed, observed him very keenly. Right? And who were touched by his example and his manners and his conduct. Okay, Inna ka ala azim. Indeed, you are on a mighty character. Laqad kana lakum fi Rasulillahi uswatun hasan. is a good example for you in the Prophet. You know, these people love the Prophet. They would sacrifice everything for the Prophet. Now, just imagine if the Prophet was here. Just imagine that, right? And wouldn't we kind of intently be observing everything about him? That's what's happening with the companions, right? So they, you know, these people are the ones that they even, some of them even killed their own parents in war. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah raised his sword and killed his father in, in war, right? For the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are the people who are, they're so impacted and they love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much. When you love somebody that much, what emanates from that person is definitely going to have an impact on you, okay? So, and not, don't forget that he has his wives, Aisha and all of these wives, who are living with him, right? So, what happens when the, when the Muslim empire, when it expands rapidly, as I showed on the map yesterday, the companions spread, right? And the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ, that's in, uh, preserved in them, his teachings, his sayings, his example, it goes with them, right? And what they do is, um, uh, the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ disperse. Okay. Um, now, some companions are busy in war, they're generals, they're governors, but some of them become full-time teachers, like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abu Darda, Abdullah ibn Abbas, these types of people. And they then have full-time students. Right? And then what happens is that you get this phenomenon of a proliferation of knowledge very, very quickly, and you get centers of knowledge happening, and people traveling distances, large distances for many months at a time, even for one hadith of the Prophet and these stories are there replete in the books of early history, right? And so this is, this is what's happening. Um, and what happens is that in the, in the, so you have the tabi'een, then you have the students of the tabi'een, right? Uh, etc, etc. And you get great scholars uh, uh, being formed or being produced. Um, okay, so... You know, you have some prominent narrators uh, in the um, time of the Prophet وسلم, Among them are Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, Aisha, Abu Huraira, Abu Darda. All of these are prominent narrators amongst the companions. The teachers, a lot of hadith get preserved through them in their, in, their, um, in, their, in, their, in their classes. And then you have prominent tabi'een. For example, one of the most uh, prolific narrators from Abdullah ibn Umar is somebody called Nafi'. Another prolific narrator is Amrah bint Abdul Rahman. She, she's a, uh, the daughter of Abdul Rahman. 
she was a great student of Aisha. And Aisha, by the way, even though she wasn't as prolific as Abu Huraira, certainly amongst all of the lists that I've given, she is the most knowledgeable of all of them. In fact, many times she corrected many of the Sahaba. She corrected Abu Huraira and Abdullah ibn Umar many, many times, saying, you've misunderstood what's happened here. This is exactly what happened, right? For example, Abu Huraira said that, you know, if a woman passes in front of, women and dog pass in front of uh, the, the, the Musalli, the person who's praying, the prayer is broken. She said, have you made us like dogs? Right? This is not what the Prophet wasallam said. Right? You've missed the whole picture. Abu Huraira got the, he was correct in his memory of the, that particular event, but he came late, she said. He came late and what the Prophet wasallam was saying something else, right? And she, 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 she corrected Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar said, something about the Prophet did Umrah four times and he did them in these months and she said no Abdullah ibn Umar was wrong he attended each of the Umrahs of Prophet ﷺ, but he did them in these months right even though he's the one that attended and not me right so that you see you see the 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 intellect of this woman really so really wish up and by the way Aisha's language is absolutely amazing when you hear her say a hadith you'll enjoy it honestly in Arabic you can't just, you can, you can see how she speaks different to everybody else. Once, um, you know, Aisha was ab abused by one of, uh, somebody, by a woman, and then she ba was patient, and the woman kept on abusing her. And then she looked at the Prophet, and then she gave it back. And the Prophet wasallam said, Innaha binti Abi ba bintu Abi Bakr. She's the daughter of Abu Bakr. Meaning that Abu Bakr knows how to speak, and Aisha knows how to speak. And when she said this, the woman couldn't reply because of her language, right? She was very, very eloquent. So anyway, all of this is happening. This, this, this wave of learning proliferates. And what, what takes place, by the way, guys, is, is, um, is an unparalleled effort at preserving the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the likes of which has never been matched by any other civilization. This discipline, Ulum al-Hadith, which we're going to look into a bit, Right? Ulum al Hadith, this, this discipline, um, no other nation has this, right? Historically, if we were to apply these criteria of distinguishing what's historical and not historical to any other nation's history, that, nation, that, that history would drop. They would, be on, they would not be stand on any other foundations, right? So this really is a, a, a unique contribution by the Muslim Ummah 1400 years ago, so sophisticated that they haven't even developed anything like that today. They can't. It's impossible. The kind of motivation that went in, the kind of zeal that went in to travel for months and to the, the, the complexity, and the, these were geniuses. Honestly, when I come to, I'll, I'll mention a few things about Bukhari if I can, if we've got time, but the genius of the man is astounding. And same with Muslim. These were geniuses. And you know, you look at the muhaddithin today, there's no comparison, really. There's, there's really no comparison. The, um, so, so, you know, the fact that we have this system to decide what he did or didn't say, did or didn't do, is nothing short of miraculous. And um, so the science of hadith came into being, basically. Okay? The science of hadith. You know, hadith sunnah. Hadith sunnah, right? Hadith is a report a hadith is a historical report, right? If I say to you, uh, Britain is currently undergoing a heat wave, that's a report, right? You've got to work out whether I'm correct or not, right? So a sunnah of the Prophet wasallam is something that we all have to follow. A hadith may establish a sunnah, but what if it's weak? What if it's abrogated? What if there's another sunnah hadith that's stronger than that sunnah? What if there's another hadith that explains that hadith, right? So hadiths are reports. They don't necessarily translate into sunnah automatically. Understand that distinction. It's an important distinction. Some people say there's a hadith, therefore, right? Uh, Tirmidhi, I'll tell you, give you an example. Tirmidhi says, all my book, in all my book, every single hadith in it, some scholar has acted upon it, except two hadiths, right? And one of them, he said, was the hadith where, where Ibn Abbas said, uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam combined between Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha in Medina, min ghayri matarin wala safar, without rain or or, or travel. Tirmidhi says no alim has ever acted upon that, right? 
So there are hadith and, and Amalik also included some hadith in his muwatta and didn't act upon them, didn't take them. And somebody asked him, why did you include this hadith and you're not acting upon it? He goes, so somebody like you will know anna ala ilmin taraknahu, that we have the knowledge of these hadiths. Not we don't now know these hadiths, but we've left them for other reasons, for more strong reasons, right? For example, the, anyway, there's, there's many examples like that. So sometimes there is a distinction between hadith. Some of the scholars may leave a hadith like Malik, like Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa did this a lot, right? Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, like, you know, or other, or, you know, other scholars because of other, other factors that they take into account. So the whole thing needs to be approached comprehensively. Okay, now, so, yes? Yes, we have to have criteria for acceptance of hadith, and one of those criteria, there's two, there's two, pro, there's two steps. The first step is, is it right or not? Is it authentic? Yeah, that's the first step we've got to decide. After we decide it is it authentic, how does it fit in with everything else? Are there other hadiths on the topic? Right? Um, you know, how have the ulama interpreted this hadith? Yeah? How does it fit in with the Quran? Right? Is there a different meaning? You know, I'll give you an example. I wasn't going to come on to this. I'll give you an example, right? Yeah, please. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. Uh, based on what you were saying, what you were, uh, all imams, they derive their source from Quran and Sunnah. Yes. 